room in our lives. No reason at all. In fact, God's instruction is the exact opposite. It is fear not. And it's neat to see this this program, again, is dedicated to the family of faith around the globe. My, I'm your host, Julie Beeler. <laughs> Forgive me for not introducing myself a couple seconds ago. I'm real excited about what the Lord's doing across this land and um, even more excited to share it with you today. So thank you so much for being here. And of course, uh, you can always go to getyourloveon.org if you'd like to either have more information about the show, if you'd like to send your questions, if you'd like to connect with the family of faith, if you're a, a little bit isolated or feel that way, connect with us, go to getyourloveon.org. As I mentioned, it's so exciting to see what the Lord's doing across this land as Christians in their boldness and in their confidence in their God, stand up and say, wait a minute, fear's a liar. What's happening? It, it, this is a lie. This is not real. It's a lie. Well, some prophets from around the globe have sent in what the Lord's been showing them. This man, his name's Sean Boltz. The Lord showed me the end of the coronavirus. The tide is turning now. This was as of February 28th. He said, God is answering the prayers and cries of the nations and is putting an end in sight. The exaggerated fear-based tactics of both the enemy and several media outlets for political reasons is coming to an end. The enemy has been trying to distract and steal from several equally important purposes and issues by dominating airwaves with conspiracy and fear. Even now, several vaccines are coming out as well as a natural, quote, dying out of the virus itself. The Lord is saying, I am removing this threat. Within a short amount of time, the extreme threat will feel like it is way in the past. Psalms 56, 9, this is the King James Version. When I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know, for God is with me. So again, as we use our voice, as we use our strength and our our authority in God Almighty to cry unto the Lord, we will see these enemies turn back and their sinister plot will not work. Here's Lance Wall now. This is as of March 6th. Uh, he says, what the Lord says about the coronavirus. I heard the Lord say, do not fear what they fear and do not call conspiracy. Everything they say is a conspiracy. I anticipate two to three weeks of nuttiness <laughs> from the world system. Yeah, you know. It's probably going to be more than that because the world is just nutty. And so we can expect that that nuttiness will change forms. It will probably be, there'll, there'll probably be toilet paper in stock again um, and water in stock again. But the nuttiness will continue because that's Satan's agenda, right? As we, we mentioned earlier, it, it is to break down. It's to cause discouragement. It's to break people down by confusion and fear. But God's ways are perfect and God doesn't allow that. He, he gives us the strength and the endurance and the confidence to see through all the nuttiness of the world's system. It says, at the same time, there is a special access to the Lord that uh, until this thing passes, the Lord says, do not fear what they fear. Yeah, they're going to kind of keep trying to come in a in a variety of of angles. And what I've noticed too is is a real put down spirit, a real put down attitude for anyone that stands in faith, for anyone that says I'm taking care of my family, I'm doing what the Lord shows me to do and then I'm standing in faith, but I will not fear. I will not fear. There's a real put down to that. There's um people that try to say, "Well, they they say you guys know what they say. I don't have to reiterate it and give it voice." But we don't have to put up with that. We can be, we can proclaim our faith, our righteousness, and our stances in God Almighty, and then watch everyone else. You know, one of my favorite scriptures is how forcible are right words. When we stand on the word of God, eventually people, they have to recognize the authority and power of God Almighty. And they will as we stand. They will. It says here, this is Robert Henderson as of March 10th. This is another prophet in the land. We are in serious times that require a seriousness in prayer and intercession for our nation and the purposes of God in it. He also said that he was given a dream and he goes, I also understood that the intent of the devil is to disrupt the economy of our nation. So we are being assigned to pray and stand with 
and stand to secure and stabilize the economy of our nation. We must take our stand and deal with the issue that the enemy would use to disrupt our economy and the economy of the nations. That's right. Uh, the American economy is an incredible force on the globe. And so we must stand to protect the growth of the economy that we've enjoyed the past few years and to protect what the Lord's doing in this land and throughout the world. Uh, here's another one. This is Johnny Enloe. This is as of March 12th. And again, these are prophets from across the, the globe that all contribute um, what the Lord's showing them. And this says, there is a quicker reprieve or turnaround and a bigger victory coming than imagined. He wars for us as we praise him. Speaking of God Almighty. And this is the best move possible. So this battle is the Lord's. The enemy is not the virus. It's not the physical thing, but it is the fear. But God is doing something even bigger in the midst. The Lord will have his way in the storm. Just a, some really neat encouragement and confirmation uh, from around the globe from different prophets that on, on what the Lord's showing them about this very interesting time. And my heart is entirely encouraged and enthusiastic about how God takes every circumstance and uses it for his benefit and for his glory. And as we stand on the word of God, we will get to be part of that. Isn't that a wonderful thing? So today I, I did a Bible study on the shortest sermon in the Bible. Do you know what it is? Do you want to take a guess? It's two words, actually. The shortest sermon in the Bible is two words, fear not. And it is in the word from Genesis to Revelations. So regardless of the circumstance, we can rest on that, that message of God, fear not. So let's go to Genesis 15, 1, the first instance of God saying, fear not. It says, after these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision saying, fear not, Abraham. A I'm sorry, it's saying, fear not, Abram. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great reward. Wow, thank you, Lord, for that. God is a buckler to all them that trust in him and our great, exceeding great reward. Isn't that an incredible thing? We can rest in that promise. We can rest in that scripture that starts with fear not. So we have to get rid of any fear in order to understand how God is our protector, how God is our shield, and obtain those exceeding great rewards from him. Let's go to Revelations now and what God has to say about the shortest sermon in the Bible, fear not. It's set in uh, chapter 1, verse 17. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. This is John the Revelator speaking. And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. Wow, isn't that an incredible comfort for our souls? Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. God is the first and he is the last. He will have the first word and he will have the last word. And so certainly we, we fear him, we fear God and nothing else. And that's why as Christ, as the Holy Spirit was revealing these things to John the Revelator, those first two words were so critical. Fear not. I am the first and the last. Let's go to 1 John chapter 4. This is a really important scripture. And again, this uh, message on fear not, on the fact that Satan would cause fear and confusion. And God never does. God says we are to fear God. We are to have that reverence for God and that understanding of who God is, but that's it. That's it. And when we choose to fear God, we can then fear not everything else. First John chapter four, verse 15, whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love. And he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God and God in him. 
this is so incredible and so special. And if there's one thing that we know the world needs more of, it's, it's love. It's God. <laughs> God is love. And, and so when you see t-shirts that say, you know, the world needs love, all we need is love. That's true to a point, as long as the definition of that word love is accurate. God is love. So yes, this world needs more God. Yes, absolutely. All we need is God. That's true. And so anytime you see that, just, well, what's your definition of love? <laughs> we can ask that question. What, what exactly is your definition of love? Because Satan has changed the, the definition of a lot of words that we use and that's why, again, I, I love the King James Version of the Bible is because we have the opportunity. Number one, it was written back in 1611. So our language was far more pure and it hadn't been diluted through generations that we see in um, Bibles that have been written, you know, basically after the in, in the 20th century, basically. So uh, it's really important that we understand, well, God is love. And that's, that's the definition of love. That's what that definition is. So anytime we see people saying, oh, love this or love that, or, um, all you need is love. That is true. As long as the definition of the word love is accurate. Uh, let's go to verse 17. Here we go. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. We'll have boldness in the day of judgment because we've used the authority that God Almighty has given us in every circumstance. We use our power over sin, sickness, and disease. We use our power to heal one another. We use our faith to heal one another. And so, yes, we will have boldness because of all those gifts that the Lord's given us. In verse 18, it says, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear because fear hath torment he that feareth is not made perfect in love so i'm going to read that again there is no fear in love there is no fear in god but perfect love cast out fear because fear hath torment god doesn't want us to be tormented by fear or or confusion or discouragement, or any of that. God wants us to have boldness in the day of judgment and confidence, not fear. Isn't this an incredible contrast? And when, when we walk through this life, as we take each step, we either take a step with boldness and with confidence in God Almighty or less than that. And so it, that's why reading the word and being in the word, it strengthens us. And it gives us that great boldness and confidence in God Almighty, not in our own abilities or our own mindset or, or the things we can do, but in God. And that's the, that's the ticket right there, friends. That's the ticket is having that boldness in God's strength and in God's wonder and in God's miraculous healings. That's where our boldness is. And that's where our our fearlessness lies, not in our own strength and not in our own abilities, but in God's strength and God's ability. Because there is no fear in love. There is no fear in God. And when we have a perfect understanding of God, when we have a perfect love, then fear is cast out, driven away, never to be seen or heard. And, and it's a marvelous life to live. It's a marvelous thing to be fearless in all things, whether that's in um, your personal life, your professional life, or your stances that that you're taking in, um, you know, within your family, within your within your life, to have everything that God desires you to have, everything that God wants you to have, we should we should have that, and we can have it. It says in verse 19. This is First John four. I'm going to read verse 18 just one more time, just to smash to smithereens the, that spirit of fear. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. 
We love him because he first loved us. So again, we have that perfect opportunity to know God through Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And God sent his only begotten son to give us the the comforter, the Holy Spirit, so that we could have all understanding, so that we could understand what this love really means, what it really entails, the grandeur of it and the scope of it. It's far beyond anything that the natural mind can understand, but it's very much something that a spiritual mind can rest in and move forward with great boldness in. So that's the ticket right here. We love him because he first loved us. God, God sent his son to initiate all this for us and to be the great victor, the eternal victor for us. So that's already been done. <laughs> so we just get to participate. We participate in it through our strength and in through our understanding of God's strength, through our boldness of in, in proclaiming Jesus Christ in Nazareth. That's how we become part of that. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, we'll start in verse 7. This is a, this is a scripture that, uh, shoot, I, I'd love to see it on t-shirts all across this nation. That's, this is an incredibly powerful scripture. 2 Timothy 1, 7, it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's a three for one offer, ladies and gentlemen. That is awesome. God has not given us the spirit of fear. Now, the spirit of fear is going to take on a lot of different looks. And it, it might um, take on a lot of different terminology. But the bottom line is, it's the spirit of fear. Well, God didn't give that to us. No way. But what he did give us? Three things. Okay, that again, let's, let's take a moment and appreciate the grandeur of God here. He's giving us three things for the one thing that Satan tries to put out there. Fear. God gives us power. Power and in what way? Well, power in over sin, sickness, and disease. Power to heal. Power to offer comforts and encouragements to strengthen the feeble knees, to, to um, embolden those that have a fearful heart. That's what God's given us. Power and love. He's given us the spirit of love. That's right. We get to love our neighbor as ourself. In a little bit, we're going to go into some scriptures here uh, um, as it pertains to Christ. But as we see people react to these different circumstances in their life, we get to love them through these different circumstances in their life. And we only know what we know. And so it's very important to un be understanding and have graciousness towards those that might be have a little bit more um, earnestness that they're proceeding through these circumstances with. And again, we'll, we'll look at the word and how it lays that out. But the bottom line is God has given us the spirit of love to love each other. And so we'll do that. And of a sound mind. Oh, yes. Thank you, Lord. I'll tell you what. That in today's day and age is a billion dollar proposition right there. To have a sound mind, to be able to evaluate the circumstances, to be able to evaluate the facts of the matter with a sound mind. Very uh, reasonable and common sense. God has given us common sense and a sound mind. So let's use it and let's, let's proclaim it and let's enjoy the fact that we have that. And let's encourage everyone in our life to also pursue a sound mind. Well, how do you do that? You get before the Lord because God has given it to us. God gives us that sound mind. Let's go to, this is 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 8 now. Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God, who hath saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began, but is now made manifest by the appearing of our Savior Jesus Christ, who hath abolished death and hath brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. 
Again, there's no fear of death. When you have Jesus Christ within your hope of glory, there is absolutely no fear of death because we walk in an immortality because Christ has brought that to light. He has brought that resurrection power to light. So let's go into Luke 12. Here's what Christ had to say about this. We're speaking about the shortest sermon in the Bible. Two words, fear not. Here's Luke 12. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, In the meantime, when they were gathered together, an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, First of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Okay, so first of all, there were an innumerable multitude of people. <laughs> they were not participating in social distancing. Bottom line. But it's because what his message was provided the enthusiasm for them to all gather around. And they knew he had the words of life within him. So certainly the innumerable multitude wanted to be there in so much that they trod one upon another. See, again, that's that sound mind that was missing here. And that's why it's important that, that apostle Paul let us know, instructed us that God has not given us the spirit of fear. We don't, we're not going to miss out when we're walking in the spirit. We're not going to miss out. We don't have to tr to tread one upon another. But we've been given a sound mind so we can patiently wait for God to reveal himself or for God to do the work in our lives that we've been asking him to do. And then, of course, Christ says, beware ye the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. Yes, heavy amounts of hypocrisy throughout the land. And it is nothing more than uh, just Satan's agenda. Hypocrisy is Satan's agenda. So watch for it. Be aware of it and with great boldness, call it out or remove yourself from it, whatever you need to do. But it is Satan's agenda. Hypocrisy is Satan's agenda. Hypocrisy is when you say um, one thing and you do the opposite. That's hypocrisy. So um, an example of that might be the fact that we are trying to um, preserve, you know, certain lives, certain animal lives, shall we say, or preserve certain rights of um, certain peoples or certain animals. But the hypocrisy is we will, the nation aborts children and doesn't protect the rights of the unborn. So that's hypocritical, that we would find it valuable to protect certain rights of people and not protect the rights of the unborn, the most vulnerable of all people. So that's hypocrisy. Um, and, and in verse two, it says right here, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known. God sees it all. And it's, it's just a matter of time before all that hypocrisy is revealed. And all those who are proclaiming these, these hypocrisies will be revealed for exactly who they are. Therefore, whatsoever ye have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which ye have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. <laughs> That's right. This the uh, the wiles of the devil. He, he thinks he's so clever, and he's not. He's not. He uses the same tactics time and time again. Fear, confusion, doubt, boom. And that's pfft, that it's so um, pathetic that th that's the only things in his arsenal. And it's so wonderful that our arsenal is incredible and eternal. And as we proclaim our faith, we get to see all that. We get to see the mighty workings of God. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities and rulers of the darkness. That's another scripture. And, um, and it's true. This isn't about fear of a virus. This is about the spirit of fear that God has not given us. All right, let's move on. Uh, we will go to verse four. Now this is Luke 12 verse four. And I say unto you, my friends, be not afraid of them that kill the body. And after that have no more that they can do. 
But I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Have an eternal perspective. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. God is love. God is love. In verse 7 it says, But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. See, this is again why it's so important to have the Spirit of the Lord. He gives us the revelations of the incredible grandeur of God's love. Now, if we try to understand what it means that every hair on our head is numbered, that's an incredible thing. Now there's what, 7.7 .7 billion people on the planet and God knows the hair on, the amount of hair on your head, even if you're bald, he knows the little follicles that might be producing hair if you didn't shave your head. That's a wonderful thing. And that's something that only the Holy Spirit can reveal the grandeur of that and help you believe that. That would be, quote, unbelievable, unquote, in a natural mind. How is that possible? And natural minds are going to say, well, that's not possible. And they won't believe it. A spiritual mind immediately knows God inhabits eternity. He sees it all. So, of course, it's immediately understood and appreciated in its grandeur. That's what it is to have the Holy Spirit. You fully understand the grandeur of God Almighty. And so you fully recognize the authority he's given us. We fully recognize the, the miracles he can accomplish. We truly believe that nothing is impossible with God. We truly believe that. It says in verse 8, Also I say unto you, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. But he that denieth me before men shall be denied before the angels of God. And whosoever shall speak a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But unto him that blasphemeth against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven. And when they bring you unto the synagogues and unto magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what ye ought to say. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Isn't that in interesting that um, this is a naturally minded person right here. Christ is laying out some incredible spiritual meat, some secrets of life right here. Fear not. Therefore, you are more valuable than many sparrows. Don't worry if you're taken before the powers or if you have a, a, a situation and that you have to answer for the Holy Spirit will teach you that same hour, what you need to say. I actually have experience with this in, in a variety of ways where the Lord just gave me knowledge instantaneously and I was able to speak it out and it nullified a situation. It calmed the situation down and that just came from the Holy Ghost. It wasn't, it wasn't me. It was the Holy Ghost that brought those words to my mouth and I was able to speak them out. And isn't that interesting that this person in this innumerable multitude the next thing he wanted to know is, Lord, he obviously recognized Christ's great authority and he was hoping that it could apply to his personal life. Lord, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Christ said, and Christ said, and he said unto him, man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? He said unto them, take heed and beware of covetousness for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. I, that word probably could have gone out a few, a uh, couple weeks ago when people were coveting toilet paper and water and, and all that. You know, I hope everyone's prepared. I hope everyone feels prepared. And that's an important thing, certainly. Um, but there's a balance, right? There's a sound soundness of mind that we apply to every situation. And here goes, this is Luke 12, verse 16. This is Christ speaking. 
And he spake parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And, I, and, and he said, Well, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? We don't know what hour the Lord will come. All we know is that as we take it day by day, step by step, and we seek God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our strength, that he will protect us and he will provide for us. And, it, and as we believe that, as we have great confidence in that, it eliminates the covetousness. It eliminates the need to hoard because we believe God will provide for us and in miraculous ways and in wondrous ways. And the, verse 21 says, So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So the one thing we can covet is the gifts of the spirit it says covet earnestly to prophesy we can covet the gifts of the spirit we can we can have a, a great um a great pursuit of all things god and godliness that that way to holiness um that was spoken about in isaiah we can run down that path of holiness with every ounce of enthusiasm and gusto that's in us but Christ is saying here, so is everyone that layeth up treasure for himself. If we think that we are going to be protected or safe from any circumstance that this world can, can uh, drum up by collecting things or money or um, thinking that the outward provisions are what provide security, we will be sorely mistaken. What provides security is knowing who to be secure in. And that's God Almighty. That provides your security. That provides your protection. And that provides your great confidence and boldness to walk through any circumstance in life. And I'm speaking pretty generically because right now our nation is under a blanket of fear due to the coronavirus specifically. But look, these kind of things come up a lot. This is a, a relatively unprecedented in time because of the cancellations of some very notable public events, certainly, and, and because of the impact that it has thus far had on our economy. But I'm proclaiming a total alteration and reversal of those negative side effects into an incredible accelerated prosper prosperity for our nation. That's what I'm proclaiming right now here. So that's why I'm speaking more generically as circumstances rather than speaking specifically as the of the coronavirus and what's happening right now in our land. Because as I mentioned earlier in the show, God is victorious. He is the victor throughout all eternity. So God's already got the victory. I've already chalked it up. <laughs> Check one, God Almighty and a negative infinity for Satan and his <laughs> efforts. But um, But it does require us to, as we said earlier, take this seriously with our prayers and our intercession and take it seriously because there are souls that are feeble, uh, feeble need and, and that do have fearful hearts. So we get to, we get to proclaim the love of God and his strength and his power and his wonder through the word of God. And as we do, we will see that tide change. Okay, so we'll go now to, this is Luke 12, and this is verse 22. And it says, and he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, neither for the body, what ye shall put on. The life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? If ye then not, if ye then be not able to do that which is least, 
why take ye thought for the rest? Such a good question. Lord, thank you so much for your wisdom and, and for laying this out in such simplicity. It's true. If we can't add to our stature, if, if there are things we can't change, then why do we even give it thought? Right? Give the Lord your thoughts. Give the Lord your attention. Give Christ your your mindset and say, well, Lord, I'm going to think on you. I'm going to think on these things and then see what happens in your life. Give it a, give it a week <laughs> and see how much more peace and love and joy. See the abounding joy that your life is every day. I had one customer. I, I mean, I have a, I'm a business development. I'm in business development and I had a customer who left me a message and then called me and I answered and he goes, are you always this happy? <laughs> he didn't even say hi, Jules. He didn't even, he, are you always this happy? And my answer was a, yeah, I, yeah, I, I am because I put my hope and I put my rest and I put my trust in God almighty. So yes, the answer is yes, I am. And it says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you, that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass, which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not, and seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be doubt of a doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your father knoweth that ye have need of all things. But rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. That's a promise of God. When we believe the word of God, we know his promises are true. And that's a promise of God. Verse 32, this is Luke 12, verse 32. This is Christ speaking. Now remember, this started with someone saying, hey, can you make my brother share his stuff with me, the inheritance? Can you make my brother share the inheritance with me? This is the wisdom of God Almighty. You have a, a natural question. You have a someone who is very narrowly focused on one little instance. And this is the wisdom of God. How much bigger is it? How much more expansive is it to the, to for Christ to then say, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added unto you. Verse 32, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. As we seek God with all our heart, all our mind, and all our strength, then it is his good pleasure to give us the kingdom. All right, we're going to take a quick musical break, and this song it, it does what we need to do right now. It's called Get Up and Praise. 